Welcome to week 7 lectures. Um, today we are going to start a network layer. Um, this is the layer uh, below transport layer and uh, last, last week we didn't have any lecture but before that we finished um, transport layer. So um, this network layer will cover um, sections 4.1 and 4.3 from your text. Um, the lecture is divided into two control pl uh, two planes, data plane and the control plane. So data plane and control plane, to understand that uh, we need to um, understand how the routers work. So this is again a reminder that uh, we are on a, a layered uh, protocol uh, architecture and the routers in the internet forward packets from source to destination um, and the packets may go through many routers on the way. And Internet Protocol, the IP, is a network layer protocol uh, that uh, allows us to transmit data through all these routers. So at the right-hand side picture here, you can see um, that uh, there um, are many networks here um, and they are interconnected by routers. And you can see that um, a client, when it wants to send some data, uh, the, trans uh, the application sends it to the transport layer, then the transport layer uh, sends it uh, to the network layer, and then the network layer will send it to the uh, next routers, and it will go through many routers. Finally, it will, receive, it will be received at the destination. Here you can see that every router is implementing the network layer. So this is very important. So all the routers in the internet will be implementing the network layer. Um, at the source and the destination, we also have the application and the transport layer. So here you can see in the animation how the packet is going through many routers and finally is received by the network layer at the destination and then the transport and the application. Okay, so to understand the um, data plane and the control plane, uh, we have to understand uh, these two important functionalities, forwarding and routing. So uh, what is forwarding and what is routing? So this is uh, very important to understand the differences uh, between these two functions. So forwarding is a local uh, functionality. So when a packet arrives at a router, the router has to forward from the input port to the output port. So um, which output port it should forward it to is the main challenge in forwarding and how to actually forward it and how to test the checksum and all these things. So all these local activities within the router is called forwarding. Routing is actually the path. Um, the routing um, is the intelligence that determines which routers, which um, interchanges uh, that the packets will go through to reach the destination. So here we have an example. So you can see um, we have uh, a network at the bottom and a packet is arriving uh, to the left hand uh, router and which has uh, three interfaces, outgoing interfaces, one, uh, label as 1, 2, and 3. So the question, the, so is, is if, if it's forwarding we are talking about, then when a packet arrives, the router has to decide which output link it should send this packet to. So this is usually done through a forwarding table. So as you can see, this router is maintaining a forwarding table and it has basically two columns. At the left hand side it has the header value in the packet. So in this case this packet is arriving with 0, 1, 1, 1 in the header. And if you uh, match this table you will see it matches the third row of the table and it says uh, that output link should be 2. So at the bottom of the figure you can see that the datagram is pushed out through output port 2. And who is creating this forwarding table? Uh, so um, the routing algorithm uh, is used to create this forwarding table in each of the uh, routers. So each router pushes it out to the right interface so it follows through the, uh, the correct order of routers to reach the destination. 
So we are going to see uh, more about uh, these uh, interplay between routing algorithm, uh, routing and forwarding. At the data plane, uh, this is all local, as we say. Uh, so um, here, as you can see, um, when a packet arrives at the uh, router, um, the uh, forwarding decision um, will will push it out to the um, output link uh, number two. In the control plane, how so control plane is about this routing. Uh, mechanism that is how you create these um, forwarding tables in each of these routers so there are two fundamental techniques to um, for, for routing so one is distributed so it means that every router will have some algorithms distributed algorithms running in them and they will interact with each other uh, to create the um, routing tables for them um, there is no central authority the other option is called Software Defined Networking, SDN, which is a relatively new idea uh, and still not widely implemented. Uh, has a central controller which decides uh, how, what each router should have in the routing tables and they push, at, they push that information to each of the routers. So let's have a look at uh, these two different uh, concepts. So here you can see in the data plane, um, at the bottom we have the data plane and um, uh, in the data plane you need this uh, forwarding table in each of the routers. And in the control plane, because we are using this uh, distributed algorithm, then every router uh, is running this routing algorithm and they are interacting with each other to create uh, this uh, routing table. So the routing algorithm in the router is responsible for creating the routing table. And once the routing, uh, sorry, the forwarding table, and once the forwarding table is created, then the packets arriving at the router uh, can be forwarded to the right uh, outgoing link. So the top part uh, where the algorithms uh, uh, are, are running to create the forwarding tables uh, is called the control plane. And the bottom part, uh, which is the uh, actual forwarding, is called the data plane. It's called data plane because the data packets are forwarded. It's the control plane because uh, the control packets are exchanged between the routers to, uh, to create the forwarding table. Now we are going to look at the SDN, Software Defined Networking Concept, which is the centralized, which has a centralized control plane. So the data plane is like before, um, and the control plane, you can see this is a centralized remote control system uh, with, with centralized servers, and they have agents in each of the routers, and they are pushing the routing table uh, to these agents. So the routing uh, decisions are actually made in the uh, remote central controller and they push the, uh, um, the decision uh, to the routers and the routers just follow them. So the routers are not running distributed algorithms in this concept. SDN is a relatively new concept. Uh, this is to scale the internet better, uh, but it's not yet widely used. And that's why in this course, we are not going to follow SDN. Instead, we are going to follow the distributed principle uh, in the control plane, uh, which is widely deployed at the moment. So basically, um, we have uh, now um, understood what's the difference between the data plane and the control plane, and what's the difference between forwarding um, and routing. Um, so just to end uh, this set of slides, uh, we, we want to remind ourselves that uh, the network layer service model, that is the service that is supported to the transport layer, uh, remember that every layer provides some service and supports the layer on top of it. Uh, the service model is best effort. It means that the network layer, which is Internet Protocol, IP, doesn't support any guarantee. So it doesn't support um, 
any in-water delivery. It doesn't uh, provide any reliable transfer. Uh, it cannot guarantee any um, timing, nothing. Um, so uh, the transport layers, um, on what they get is the best effort service. So with that, um, Okay, so for uh, data plane, uh, we are going to study now, next is Internet Protocol, section 4.3. So you can see it's 4.1 and 4.3 uh, from uh, chapter 4 for uh, data plane. Uh, the Internet Protocol, we are going to study uh, a, a number of things. Uh, datagram format, uh, which tells you the uh, format of the packet uh, header. Uh, it's a very interesting concept such as fragmentation and uh, addressing scheme uh, for the destination and the source addressing, uh, network address translation, and a little bit of uh, what's happening with IPv6. Uh, so you can see there's a quite a, a bit of thing, uh, quite a, a list of things that we have to cover to understand uh, data plane. At the network layer, this is again a reminder that network layer is sitting just below the transport layer and just above the link layer. But what you can see here, then the network layer, we have uh, quite a number of things. We have these uh, routing uh, algorithms that will run in the network layer uh, because this is the job of the network layer. And this is the control plane actually. Uh, and later we'll study when we study the control plane uh, specific routing algorithms such as RIP and OSPF. Then we have the forwarding table as we have seen uh, a few minutes ago and then uh, we have uh, another interesting thing called ICMP, uh, Internet Control Message uh, Protocol. Uh, this uh, protocol is also at the network layer. This is for control uh, and error messaging purposes between the routers. Uh, for example, sometimes um, there is some problem uh, of forwarding the datagram in one of the routers uh, and, and the routers need to uh, send some message back to the previous router that don't send me this kind of IP datagrams, for example. Uh, we will have some examples like this uh, later in the lecture. And then you have this IP protocol, um, which uh, when a packet comes in, uh, the router has to process this packet. So you, we need to know what kind of addressing scheme is used by the IP protocol, uh, what sort of processing is needed for the IP datagram and things like that. So the network layer is quite busy, as you can see. So uh, in this specific part, uh, we are going to study uh, the, uh, the format of the packet header. So this is how the packet header looks like. You can see it's a very busy packet header. Um, we have about 12 different fields and we have um, a total of five word, by the way. So one word is usually 32 bit. So you have 20 bytes of header. So you can see it's, it's very uh, significant, very complex. And uh, the header, uh, the reason that there, there are so many different fields is because the router uh, needs to process uh, each IP datagram uh, from many different aspects and each field uh, helps the, the router uh, to process the packet. So what we are going to do over the next uh, few slides uh, in this part is to understand these fields and if you understand these fields, then you understand the, the, the processing that takes place on the IP datagram when it arrives at the router. Four bit version uh, is just the version of IP. Uh, as you know that currently we are using IP version four, uh, but IP version six is on the horizon. So you just put the version number here. So when the datagram comes, uh, the operating system can process it correctly because IPv4 has a different uh, kind of processing needed and IPv6 is different. Then the next one is 4-bit header length. So what is this about? So here you can see the blue uh, row uh, is options uh, in the header. So options means they are uh, the, the header is usually 20 bytes, but you can 
have some options. Uh, if you have options, then the header is more than 20 bytes, and you need to tell it upfront uh, to the router so it can process. It knows that the options are coming and it needs to process the options. So this 4-bit header length is measured in a number of 32-bit words. So if it is the standard uh, 20 byte, then the number there is 5. And 16-bit total length is the total length of this datagram or IP packet, including the header. And it's 16-bit and it's measured in bytes. Because it's measured in bytes, you need lots of bits, 16 bits, so 2 to the power 16, so you will see that this maximum IP datagram size would be technically possible is 65,535. Um, as you can see here, um, 65,535 bytes, so 0 to 65,535. This is the maximum size though, um, and in practice is usually less because you cannot fit such large in, in, in the most practical link layer uh, frames. We are going to discuss that later. Okay, so the next set of um, fields that are uh, of interest is the source address and the destination address and we all know that we are we are at the moment using 32-bit addresses for IPv4. What is this 8-bit protocol? So the payload of IP datagram is carrying uh, either TCP or is using or carrying uh, UDP or it could even carry ICMP, as you can see here. So, um, because ICMP is running in the IP layer as well. So when the datagram comes, uh, the, the router uh, or the host needs to decide which uh, protocol module it needs to pass the payload. Should it be TCP, should it be UDP or ICMP? So there are numbers, and in the protocol 8 bits, you put 6 if you want the TCP to process it, you put 17 if it's a UDP packet carried in the payload, or if it's an ICMP message, then 1 is there in the 8 bits uh, protocol field. How about the 8-bit time to live and 16-bit identification and 16-bit header checksum? Okay, so if you look at the uh, second row here, you can see there is 16-bit identification, 3-bit flags, and 13-bit fragment offset. So these three fields are used uh, for fragmentation. So fragmentation uh, is something needed uh, when the size of the IP datagram is larger than the underlying uh, physical network. For example, Ethernet is 15, uh, cannot carry more than 1500 bytes uh, in its payload in the frame. And if you are sending uh, more than that, then the packet has to be uh, uh, fragmented. So how you fragment, how you have to reassemble, uh, we have to use these identification flags and 13-bit fragmentation offset, which we are going to study soon um, later in the lecture. 8-bit time to live, TTL. So what is TTL? Um, uh, TTL... Uh, is uh, needed because um, so the packet um, can uh, loop uh, through different uh, routers uh, because um, when we study the routing protocols you will see that if, uh, in, uh, if, if there are some intermediate or um, temporary problems uh, while the routing tables are being built um, then the packets can go back and forth uh, between different routers in a loop and that wastes resources. Uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, you want to stop, stop this uh, packet going around and you use an integer uh, usually set to 255 and each router, the first thing they do is decrement this TTL field um, and the router 
which um, after decrementing gets a zero, means this packet has to be dropped. This packet has been there for too long uh, in the network and it's wasting resources. It must be in a loop, so it has to be dropped. So TTL field is very useful for controlling and preventing, uh, sorry, preventing the loops uh, in the uh, inter internet routing. And checksum is um, basically um, to um, um, check whether the header has been corrupted or not. So this checksum is called header checksum because it uh, checks only the um, header uh, of the IP datagram, not the payload. Okay, uh, so the header, uh, checking the header for uh, bit error uh, is important because the routers do not want to waste their uh, resources uh, by processing the packet uh, if it is already corrupted and it's not giving you the right information. Uh, you might wonder why um, the, the checksum is not um, calculated uh, for the uh, payload, uh, why the payload is not included, why is just the header. Um, so the reason is uh, the payload is, is basically a TCP or UDP packet and the TCP header and UDP header already have uh, checksum and as a result the payload is already uh, taken care of uh, by the checksums in by TCP and UDP. So that uh, concludes our um, set of slides here explaining um, how the uh, header is constructed, the IP header. And as you can see, we have learned that there are so many, dif uh, so, so there's so many different fields in the header and each field has some purpose and uh, the router has to act on each of these fields and that's why the routers are very busy. Okay, uh, we are now going to study uh, IP fragmentation and uh, reassembly. Uh, remember that we said that um, IP packets can be too large uh, to fit in the uh, link layer. Uh, so when a router receives the IP packet, if it's too large, uh, then the underlying uh, network frame uh, then the IP packet would not fit. So one of the options is, of course, for the router to drop the packet. Uh, in that case, it will never uh, go through that router. Or the router can actually um, fragment the IP packet into many smaller, uh, smaller pieces of IP packets so they can go through the router and then they would be reassembled back at the destination, at the final destination, not at the intermediate routers, right? So this is called maximum transmission unit uh, at, at the uh, router link layer. So if the maximum transmission uh, unit uh, is smaller than the IP packet, then you have to do the fragmentation. So now we are going to look at an animation to understand the process better. So at the right hand side, you can see a network. And uh, the first router sends a large IP packet to the second router. Uh, this IP packet was uh, small enough for the maximum transmission unit of the first router, but this uh, too large for the maximum transmission unit for the second router. So the second router now has to uh, segment it, it fragment the IP packet. So here we see that uh, the incoming large datagram is fragmented into three smaller datagrams. Now it's important to understand that each of these fragments is a uh, independent standalone uh, IP datagram with its own 20 byte IP headers. Now when it goes to the third router, the third router actually sends these pieces one by one instead of reassembling them. So they are uh, received as three different IP packets, smaller IP packets at the destination and this destination uh, IP layer in the operating system of this host or server will reassemble them, put them back into the original uh, IP packet. Uh, so the uh, TCP um, or UDP uh, segment inside the IP payload can be retrieved 
correctly. So we have seen how the fragmentation and the reassembly process works uh, from an abstract level. Next, we are going to uh, see uh, how this is implemented uh, using specific fields in the IB header inside the router. To understand that, we are going to look at four different fields that are responsible uh, for these fragmentations uh, and reassembly, or if you like, uh, useful. So the first one is length. The length tells us uh, what is the length of this IP datagram in bytes. So in this particular example, we are looking at the IP datagram, which is 4000 byte uh, long. And the ID is X. Uh, remember, there is the ID field, and this ID field would be very useful for fragmentation and reassembly. Then we have flag. There are three flag bits. One of the flag bits is fragmentation, MF, more fragments. So when this uh, MF is one, it means uh, that you, you, you are fragmenting, and the offset. So the offset uh, is where, uh, so if you are fragmenting into uh, multiple pieces, then you need to know this fragment is sitting where in this um, uh, in this uh, big IP packet. Is it in the beginning? Is it in the middle? Is it at the end? So this MF flag and offset together tells you whether this datagram uh, is a fragment and where the offset is. So for example, if both of them are zero, if MF is zero and offset is zero, then this datagram is not a fragment at all. Okay, so let's start our uh, example, 4,000 byte datagram, and let's assume that the maximum transmission unit is 1,500 bytes, which is the case for Ethernet. So in this example, as you can see, we have divided, we had to divide and fragment this IP datagram into three fragments, right? The first one, uh, uh, we'll have length 1500, second one 1500, and the last one is 1040. And for all of them, it will have the same ID XXX. So this is useful at the destination for reassembly. They can see that all these fragments belong to um, packet ID X. For the first fragment, you can see MF is 1, offset is 0. So MF1 means this is a fragment, and offset 0 means it's the beginning. Uh, of the IP datagram. Then the next one is again MF is 1 and offset is uh, 185. We are going to see how we calculate the offset. And the last one is higher offset uh, and MF is 0. So the reason the MF is 0 at the end is um, it indicates that uh, this is the last fragment of the IP packet. And uh, the offsets tell you the relative positioning uh, within the um, IP datagram. So how do we calculate the offsets and um, how does it work? So first of all, um, 4000 byte datagram means 3980 bytes in the payload. Uh, so this IP is carrying 3980 uh, bytes of data because 20 is uh, header. So the fragment one can carry only 1480 bytes because it has to carry the IP header as well. And by the time you carry another 20 bytes, it becomes 1500 and 1500 is the maximum transmission unit. So is the second fragment is 1480 and the remaining one uh, would be 1020 bytes left that would go into the last fragment. So how do you calculate the offsets? So the first offset is zero, is carrying uh, 1480 bytes. And the second offset is how many bytes are carried in the uh, first um, fragment uh, divided by eight. So in this case, this is uh, 1480 divided by eight, which gives us 185. So offset is 185. From now on, uh, the offsets are multiplied by the fragment number. So uh, the offset for the third one is 185 times 2 because it's the third offset. Uh, so it's 370. 
actually in the internet you will find some um, online IP fragmentation calculators uh, to play with different uh, MTU size and different IP datagrams to find out what is the length and what would be the uh, offset values and you can also use this example to double check with these calculators so what I have done I have uh, given you the link to one of the calculators um, in that uh, week 7 uh, lecture uh, section so go and play with it. Interesting thing is that once you do the fragmentation, then um, the header uh, fields are changing. Uh, as a result, you have to recompute the checksum. So when the fragmentation is done for each fragment, uh, the router will have to recompute the checksum. Another interesting thing is you can have recursive fragmentation. So you, one router fragments IP into, let's say, three fragments and send them and sends them to the downstream router. But this downstream router uh, might have a smaller MTU than the upstream router. In that case, each of these fragments will have to be uh, refragmented into even smaller pieces. Or if one of the IP fragment takes a different route than the other fragments and uh, the downstream router for that fragment has a smaller MTU, then that particular fragment will have to be refragmented into smaller ones. So let's take an example. So in this example, you, see, you can see the original um, has 4,000 uh, bytes and it's fragmented into uh, three um, fragments. Uh, the MTU in this case is 1,420. And the middle fragment takes a different route and the downstream router has an MTU of 820. So uh, the middle fragment, which is fragment 2, is now fragmented into two smaller pieces, fragment 2.2 and fragment 2.1 as you can see at the rightmost uh, column of this slide. So the values, uh, you should be able to calculate uh, these values uh, in the um, header uh, of all of these fragments. So I encourage you to do these uh, computations and double check if they are correct. Um, so one of the thing, interesting things here is um, none of these fragments will be reassembled in the middle of the network. Uh, they will all be transmitted all the way to the destination as fragments and it's the responsibility of the destination to reassemble them back. And the interesting thing here is uh, so now in this case we have five fragments and even if they arrive out of order uh, then still the reassembly process will be able to uh, piece them back into the original uh, IP datagram correctly because we have these offsets. Uh, you can see here, if you look at the middle one, uh, middle column, then you can see in fragment one, the offset is zero. Then in fragment 2.1, offset is two, uh, 2.2 the offset is 175 then in 2.1 the offset is 275 then in fragment 3 the offset is 350 so it knows the relative positioning of these smaller fragments so it can put back them into uh, correct uh, order to reproduce the original IP datagram without any error so this is a great um, uh, mechanism um, so as long as uh, none of the fragments are lost, uh, the destination should be able to reassemble them. So IP layer will have some uh, buffer to buffer these fragments until they get the last fragment where the offset uh, at the MF uh, is uh, zero. If one of these fragments are lost, of course, uh, then uh, there would be... Uh, no problem uh, of detecting that there is a problem because the uh, offset calculations uh, are uh, done accordingly. Okay, so now we uh, switch to a slightly different topic, uh, special um, handling uh, fields. So we never talked about this 8-bit type of service. Uh, 
So what is this? So now um, you know that uh, we've been saying that IP is best effort. That's the service model. But as we start to send more and more um, non-data services, such as voice and video, uh, which require uh, a little better than best effort, um, it may be uh, useful to tell the router that what kind of um, contents you have in the uh, IP packet. So you can use this 8-bit uh, type of service. Um, and you can use one of the codes uh, to tell it uh, what you want, what kind of service you want. And if the routers support that, then uh, they can give you some differentiated services uh, based on this code. And this way it would be uh, possible to get a better treatment for your audio and video compared to data. However, uh, I might have told you in the beginning of this course that uh, this is complicated for the routers and uh, because of that the ISPs do not use it uh, most of the time and as a result um, internet still remains the uh, best effort service. Option is another field that uh, we said that could be used in the header and um, so let's see what options can be used for. So this is a recap of the datagram format. We have discussed all these fields except the options field. So the options can use some timestamps, for example. Um, so for example, if you are going to use um, any measurement, uh, so you, you timestamp it and then you get the packet back and you can look at the timestamp or if you want some um, uh, real-time services then perhaps you can use the options field uh, to use some strict timing uh, requirements uh, for your packet and things like that. So just uh, recapping uh, this particular part uh, we have now learned um, uh, how to do the fragmentation. Uh, fragmentation uh, is one of the uh, very uh, interesting and important uh, process for the routers and we know how to fragment and how to reassemble them uh, back. So by now perhaps uh, you, you already um, can uh, understand that um, the fragmentation is a huge job for the routers because it has to uh, do all these fragmentations, send the packets separately and also recalculate the checksums and things like that. So it is advisable for the source to actually do a uh, path MTU discovery uh, if possible, and then um, and then decide on the IP datagram size. So, as long as the IP datagram goes through this particular path, then it will never have to be fragmented by any of the routers in this path. So now we are going to look at the path MTU discovery uh, protocol or procedure, if you like, uh, that is used in the internet. So in this example, we have a source at the left-hand side and a destination at the right-hand side, and there are two routers in the path. The first router has an uh, MTU 1200, and the second router has an MTU of 900 bytes. So how do we discover that the 900 is the minimum? Okay, so you start uh, with a uh, large IP datagram in the beginning. So we start in this particular example with 1400 bytes. So the source sends 1400 byte IP datagrams, but it sets DF flag to one. So if you set this DF, DF means don't fragment. It means the first router, uh, when they see the don't fragment, then, then they are not allowed to fragment the packet. Uh, they, they just have to drop it. Uh, but they will also have to generate an ICMP error message uh, back to the upstream uh, device uh, saying that uh, my MTU is 1200, so can you try 1200 next time? So the source next time in test 2 uses 1200 bytes, so first router happily uh, sends it, uh, forwards it to the next router, but the next router has 900 uh, MTU, so it generates ICMP 900 uh, back to the source 
and the source in test 3 tries 900 and this time both router 1 and router 2 happily forward the packet all the way to the destination so in this case the path m2 discovery uh, is successful with 900 so from then on the source can send the ip datagrams uh, that are um, less than or equal to 900 bytes so the, the there would be no fragmentation as long as these ip datagrams travel through this particular path of course if the path changes in the internet um, because the routers go and, and come and go and then of course then uh, there would be fragmentations or a path uh, MT discovery procedure has to be done again for the new path. Okay, so far we have learned um, the datagram format, the header fields. We have learned how to fragment and reassemble IP packets. The next thing we are going to learn is IP addressing. Uh, remember, there are two large fields in the IP header, the source address and the destination address. Every device in the internet must have a unique IP address in the world uh, to communicate with other uh, devices and, and at any particular time. So what we are going to study is how this addressing is done, how, uh, how, what's the format of this addressing, uh, you know, how addressing is allocated and things like that. In this particular part and set of slides, uh, we are going to uh, study uh, an original um, addressing scheme called uh, classful addressing. So the first thing is uh, addresses are 32 bits and they are act, the notation that is used is dotted decimal. Uh, it means, as, uh, as you can see in this picture, um, you can either write uh, in binary 32 bit or you can take the first octet uh, 8 bits and convert it into decimal, the second octet convert it into decimal and things like that and then use a dot between them so you are actually writing in dotted decimal which is easier for a human to follow um, and uh, these addresses are allocated to the interface, network interface of a device. A client device such as a uh, laptop, desktop, uh, iPad, uh, mobile phone, they will have uh, usually a single interface, uh, but a router, as you can see in this picture, uh, will have multiple interfaces. Um, so in this case, you can see that this particular router is connected to three networks, so it has uh, three IP addresses. So how the um, IP uh, interfaces are actually connected. Uh, this is something we are going to learn in the link layer, but uh, we can tell you a couple of things. So uh, if it is a wired network, then you use Ethernet switches and then uh, you run a cable from your uh, desktop uh, to the switch and you give an IP address to that interface. If you are uh, connecting your device via the uh, Wi-Fi, then you will have a Wi-Fi uh, router and this router will have uh, wireless interfaces. So in this particular case, you can see there are two uh, IP addresses, two interfaces to this Wi-Fi router, 223.1.3.1 and 223.1.3.2. So the next thing you need to know is that every uh, address has uh, two part, uh, the network part and the host part. So the network part uh, is uh, when all the devices in the network uh, will have the same uh, network part and they will be different by the host part. So uh, in this example you can see there are three sub networks uh, interconnected by the router and in each subnet uh, the network part is the same. So in the bottom subnet for example here you can see uh, 223.1.3 is uh, for all the interfaces and uh, you do not um, need a, a router to communicate uh, between the devices that are connected to the same subnet. But if you look at the other subnets, uh, for example, the left uh, hand side, top left, then you see it's a different network address, 223.1.1. And all the devices uh, there uh, do have the same uh, network address, 223.1.1. 
and they are different in the uh, last uh, eight octet. Uh, the first one is 0.1, the second one is 0.2, and the last one is 0.3. So here is uh, um, a question for you. So you can see uh, many networks are interconnected by routers. Um, so the question here is how many uh, networks can you see here? Well, um, one thing to note that you can have actually point-to-point -point networks. Uh, so in this example, you can see two routers are connected by a, a cable, and that cable is a network. Uh, this is called a point-to-point -point network. So we have three point-to-point -point networks and uh, three uh, normal networks, so we have six networks. Okay, an important concept um, for the routers is to find out when a datagram comes in to find out what is the network address. Uh, later you will see that all routing is based on the network address, not the full 32-bit address. So the important job for the router is to understand um, how many bits uh, in that 32-bit is the network address and uh, which bits actually uh, constitute uh, the uh, host address. So to do that, uh, a process uh, called masking is used. To understand masking, let's uh, look at this table. Uh, so in this slide, we can see um, host B has a, a, an IP address 223.1.1.2, and it has a mask of 255.255.255.0. .255 .255 .255 so how this mask is used with this IP address to find out that the network is 223.1.1 and the host part is 2, the last 2. Because the mask is 255.255.255.0, it means in the binary representation you can see that uh, 255 means it's all ones. And um, if you do the binary and bitwise and operation of the 32-bit IP address and the mask, then, it, then what you get is the network part, because the, the host part will be all zero. And uh, you know that the bitwise and means uh, if you have one in the mask, then it will be just copied, and if it is zero, it will be masked. So uh, after doing the masking, you get the network part, and the remaining part is your host part. So in this case, host address is that point 2, and the network is 223.1.1. Just one thing uh, to remember that um, for the host uh, address, all zeros and all ones are avoided because all zeros uh, means um, the, the, uh, all, all zeros um, are used for the network address and uh, all ones are used for broadcast. Uh, we'll, we'll see that again later uh, in the lecture. So let's have a look at the original internet uh, addressing, uh, how they use the network address and the host address. So the interesting thing is originally uh, they, they used a network address only 8 bits for the network address and 24 for the host. So with 8 bits you get 256 networks and with 24 bits for the host you get 16.7 million uh, hosts. So at that time they thought that okay 256 large networks in the world should be enough. Um, we, we are talking about 40 years ago when there were not um, internet was not widely used, and then later um, they uh, created more uh, structure uh, into the uh, network uh, and host addressing. Um, so this is called class full addresses. They created three classes A, B, C. Um, so as you can see, um, the, the, the way they differ is the size of the network, uh, network address. So for class A, it's only 8 bits, uh, in class B is 16 bits, and class C 24 bits. And as a result, the host uh, bits uh, are decreasing in class A 24, in class B 16, and in class C 8. 
how do we identify uh, so if the first bit is 0 then it's class A if the first bit is 1 then it could be B or C so you look at the second bit um, and then 1 0 mean B and if the second bit is 1 then you look at the third bit then it's C and class D is a multicast address uh, this is something different it's not a point-to-point -point communication but it's a point to multi-point communication something that uh, we'll not discuss uh, right now and class is uh, defined for experimental purposes you know the internet um, we, we do many uh, improvements of the internet so we need some experimental facilities and class E is used for experimental development so the interesting things here is you can see in class A um, because the the first zero bit is, is is used to identify class A and cannot be used uh, you basically have seven bits uh, for the network address and 2 to the power 7 is only 128 uh, different class A networks are possible and each of these class A you can have 224 hosts so the range you can see is from um, uh, here is given 1.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 to 127.255.255.255. So these are the range of uh, IP addresses that would be uh, classified as class A. So similarly, you can go and see how class B is classified and how class C is classified. So for example, in class C, you can see uh, there are a lot of class C networks are possible because you have 21 bits available, so 2 to the power 21 different class C networks uh, can be allocated in the world, and each class C uh, uh, network can have 2 to the power 8, 256 hosts connected to it, um, actually uh, 256 uh, minus 2, because uh, all zeros and all ones cannot be allocated. So what's the problem? Uh, so the main problem here uh, in, in class full addressing scheme is that the networks only come in three uh, sizes, uh, class A, A, B, and C. So this was used until the introduction of class less uh, addressing CIDR CIDR uh, in 1993. So this is just to check uh, how do you understand uh, the class. So you can see we have already discussed this. If the first bit is 0, then it's class A. And uh, then if the first bit is 1, then you check the second bit. And the second bit is 1, then you check the third bit to find out the classes. So what are the problems with the class full addresses? Uh, for example, if an organization requires 512 addresses, for example, and you have this ABC so how, how are you going to do the allocation so if you uh, allocate it class C for example then it has only uh, 8 bits for host address so it means 2, 2 to the power 8 256 uh, minus 2 254 different hosts can be connected so this is obviously not good right so you can you have to allocate two different uh, class C uh, networks. Uh, so um, or more than uh, multiple class C networks. So one network allocation is not enough. Or you can say, okay, I will just allocate class B. But if you allocate one class B a network for this organization, then it can have two to the power sixteen different hosts, and it, it needs only five hundred and twelve. So it will be wasting a lot of uh, addresses. So as you can see, uh, only uh, having A, B, C, three different classes is too rigid uh, for the requirements uh, of the world at this point of time. So because of that, um, we need a more flexible addressing scheme. And later you will see that uh, we will study something called classless. So the network addresses uh, can have any number of bits in the network and it's very flexible and uh, anything can be allocated to any organization. So this is the end uh, for uh, this part. And um, next topic we study is subnetting. So what happens is uh, if you are using ABC uh, network, then um, 
if you get a uh, class B, for example, um, and then you have many smaller networks within your network. So, for example, a large um, university, for example, might have many departments, and each department uh, wants their own network. Of course, you can go and get um, hundreds of class C networks, uh, but then one organization will end up with many different networks, and the, the routers will have to store um, network addresses, hundreds of network addresses in the routing tables for the single organization. A better approach is to uh, divide a large network into very many smaller sub-networks within the organization uh, so that the subnetting remains transparent outside the site and the routers outside uh, the site in the internet will not have to know how many subnets you have, what the subnets are, etc. They will have a single routing entry uh, for this site in their router. So this is a more scalable solution uh, from the point of uh, routing infrastructure view in the internet. So today we are going to learn about how subnetting is done. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the way it is done is in this slide you can see that the, in the beginning when you don't do any uh, subnetting you have the net ID and host ID, right? So this is why what we have studied. Uh, now if you want to do subnetting, so rest of the world still knows your net ID only and root packets all the way to your site, but now you use some bits from your host ID and you create a subnet ID. So your subnet ID is actually your uh, net ID plus these extra bits. So in this case, uh, in this particular example, uh, in this slide, uh, we have taken eight bits from the host ID to gain uh, subnetting. So let's do a uh, quick uh, quiz to see how subnetting works. So here the question is a company has this uh, site address 201.70.64.0. It's a class C address, so 24 bits for the net ID. And it wants to uh, create six subnets. So can we design the six subnets? How do we design these subnets? Okay, first of all, um, the number of subnets you will get is a power of two because uh, if you are using uh, two bits from the host ID as subnet ID, then two to power two is four subnets. Uh, if you want to use three bits, then there would be eight subnets and so on. So in this case, uh, four subnets not enough. Uh, so you need three bits because uh, you have six subnets. So we are going to use three bits. So here you can see that the mask um, in the beginning was 255.255.255.0, but the mask has now changed. As you can see, uh, we are taking uh, three bits from the host ID, so the mask will have three more ones. Um, so it will be 255.255.255.224. That's your subnet mask, um, and you will have remaining uh, five bits uh, to um, uh, address your hosts uh, in each of these subnets. So you will have uh, 32 address space in each subnet. So in this slide we see how the um, address space look like for the uh, subnets. So you can see in the first row, um, we have it 201.70.64.0 all the way to 201.70.64.31. Then the second subnet, 201.70.64.32, and then it goes all the way another 31, 201.70.64.63, and so on. So what's the how, how do we do it? What's the process? So if you uh, recall, um, to get the subnet, we have to allocate some bits uh, from the host ID. So here for the first subnet, the, the three bits from the host ID would be 000. For the second subnet, it will be uh, 001. 
for the uh, and the, for the last one it will be 111 and when it is 111 it is 224 and that's why you can see that the last uh, row is 224 so this uh, example shows you how the uh, in this particular case uh, each of the eight subnets uh, will have their address space so subnetting um, is uh, is a very important uh, topic uh, in address allocation and uh, forming uh, networks within a network uh, which is very practical a need for uh, many organizations and now we know the very basics of uh, subnetting. Um, okay, so since 1993, we've been using uh, classless addressing. This is called CIDR, classless inner domain routing. The main thing here is a greater flexibility in allocating uh, networks. Um, instead of using only uh, 8, 16, or 24 that we had in uh, classful addressing, now we can have any number of bits in the network prefix. So in this example, what you see is a network with uh, 23 um, bits, and the address space uh, can be um, from 200.23.16.0 to 200.23.17.255. So what we are going to do is look at a uh, few problems, um, trying to solve a uh, few problems, uh, simple problems of different uh, number of bits in the network uh, ID to see how it works. So the first one is slash 24, and the question is what is the range of the block? Because it is 29, if you break it down into um, binary, then you will see there are only three bits uh, in the host ID and the 29 um, bits um, in this particular uh, address space looks like this. So it will be um, only eight addresses in this block and the range will be uh, 205.16.37.24 to 205.16.37.31. So you should be able to um, figure out uh, these uh, address space from this slash 29 notation. The second one is slash 25. So it's another uh, example for you to work out. And here you can see because it's slash 25, then we have only seven bits. So 20, 128 addresses and uh, all zeros and all ones are not used. So you have actually 126 that are usable. And here the um, subnet part and the host part uh, would look like this. So the, uh, the question is, how do you do the uh, allocation? Uh, so when an ISP has a block of address uh, space, uh, how does it allocate uh, smaller uh, blocks to different customers? And we are also going to see how uh, individual um, uh, cu customers, uh, individual devices can also get an address uh, from the network. So here is an example of an ISP of slash 20 notation and it is allocating um, address spaces, uh, sub blocks of slash 23 to eight organizations. Here you can see uh, each organization has um, only three bits. Uh, each, each organization has a slash 23 notation. And this was solved by adding three more bits uh, into the net ID of the ISPs. So um, this is kind of an example also like a subnet that we have uh, learned uh, previously. Now we are going to look at a more complicated uh, address distribution uh, for a, an ISP with slash 16 notation. Uh, in this case, uh, the problem is complicated because um, the, there are three groups of customers and each group uh, has a different set of customers and each customer has a different uh, requirement. So in the first group, we have 64 customers requiring 256 each. And the second one, 128 customers, each requiring 128 addresses. And the third group, 128 customers 
with even smaller uh, need 64 addresses so how we are going to solve this problem so in the first group you can see uh, because it requires each customer uh, requires 256 is 2 to the power 8 so it means um, the suffix length is 8 it means prefix length is 32 minus 8 is 24 so it means all the customers will have slash 24 notation and you can start with 190.100.0.0 slash 24 all the way to 190.100.63.0 slash 24 to allocate these uh, slash 24 addresses to 64 customers and you use up a total of 16,384 addresses for the second group you have 128 customers each requiring 128 so 2 to power 7 is 128 it means 32 minus 7 25 uh, is your prefix length uh, network prefix length so the allocation here you can see uh, all of the customers will have slash 25 similarly in group 3 all the customers will have slash 26 now you need to go back and work this out um, and the important thing here is to uh, make sure that there is no overlap uh, between the address spaces that you are allocating to different customers uh, and this is the most important thing because if there is overlap then you are address uh, allocating the same address to different customers it's not gonna work and here you can see that this ISP had 65,536 different addresses and now uh, it has allocated already 40,960 so it still has 24,576 left the challenge is to allocate that in a way so that it doesn't overlap with the existing allocations what we are going to see next is uh, a, an interesting uh, concept of hierarchical addressing um, so what you see here there are two different ISPs the first ISP fly by night has slash 20 uh, notation um, and then it allocates uh, sub blocks from this slash 20 to many customers in this case uh, eight different organizations with slash 23 but if you look at the routers in the internet at the right hand side which are the uh, backbone internet routers they don't need to know about those organizations slash 23 they will have a single entry of slash 20 for this isp so all the packets with slash 20 will go to this isp and then this isp can uh, do the routing to different organizations similarly for isps are us it will be a slash 16 entry in the routers so the routers will have uh, very simple entries to manage a lot of customers in the world now the problem is if one of the organizations one of the customers of fly by night uh, wants to change isp so in this case let's say organization one wants to move to isp or isps are us so what will be the problem the problem is of course if we don't do anything then the packets will still go to uh, fly by night isp because uh, organization one which is 200.23.18.0 slash 23 is a sub block within the bigger block of slash 20 so the options are either you renumber uh, the, this new orga, uh, this organization one and give it a proper address which belongs within the block of slash 16 ISPs are us or um, you do something else so let's look at this something else so this is the situation organization one has moved and connected via ISPs are us but it's still using that slash 23 address space so here the problem is the internet will have to make sure that uh, this slash 23 this particular slash 23 which is 200.23.18.0 slash 23 doesn't go to fly by night but it actually goes to ISPs are us so how can we achieve that the solution lies in the concept uh, called longest prefix matching so what is longest prefix matching and how does it work uh, 
So you can see fly by night um, ISP has slash 20 notation, but these ISP uh, but this uh, 200.23.18.0 slash 23, which is actually a sub block uh, within this fly by night, this sub block is actually now in ISPs are us. So it means this particular sub block will have to be routed differently. So you need a separate entry in the router for this particular sub block, which is a longer, which has a longer prefix 23 uh, instead of 20. And any ad IP address which matches this 20 will also match this slash 23. So longest prefix match says that if it uh, matches multiple entries, then you pick up the longer match and make the decision based on that. So here we have a routing table with three entries in the, uh, in the routing table. So on the left-hand side, you have the uh, network prefix. And on the right hand side is the link interface that you have to forward to if it matches to that entry and you have two examples at the bottom so the these are the um, uh, IP address so you are getting um, this um, so if you look at the example one if you get this IP address then uh, it will match to the first entry uh, it will not match to the second entry, it will not match to the third entry. So your decision is very simple, you forward it to link interface 0. But if you look at the second example, then you will see that it's matching the second and the third as well. Uh, so what do you do? The second one is longer than the third one, so you have to send the packet to link interface 1. So this is the essence of longest prefix match. So if you um, have uh, a slash 23 from the previous example, uh, then uh, slash 23 will, will, be, uh, have, will have priority than slash 20. So here is another example. So if you uh, receive a packet uh, with uh, 1101001, then where you are going to send? So here you can see you are going to have match uh, in the first one and in the second one. So the second one is longer, two bits, so you are going to forward it to uh, interface B. So we are going to finish off this um, CIDR um, with a note how it gets allocated by the internet, right? Um, which ISPs will get which block. So um, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, allocates some address spaces to different regions in the world, Asia, Pacific, Africa, Latin America, and America. And uh, if you are located in a particular geographic uh, area, then you have to get your uh, numbers from those ISPs. So here is uh, an example of progressive hierarchical uh, allocation of address space starting from uh, ICANN all the way to a specific host in Australia. So let's say ICAN gives Asia Pacific region uh, several slash eight allocations and then Telstra gets one of the slash eight allocation uh, called 129 slash eight. And the network prefix looks like this. And then UNSW, a big customer of Telstra, gets a slash 16 uh, from this uh, 100, uh, 129 slash 18. So uh, it, it gets, let's say, this is specific 129 slash 94 slash 16. And then uh, CSE gets uh, a slash 24 out of that. And finally, when you connect a device to CSC, you might get an address uh, like 51, which belongs to this particular slash 24. Um, and this is how uh, you can see uh, the address uh, is allocated from all the way from the ISP to a specific uh, host. So what we have learned is uh, the network uh, allocation can be very flexible. Um, the network uh, prefix can be of any length and any slash uh, 8, 9, 10, 20, 21 um, and um, an ISP can allocate to different customers then the customers can allocate to their sub-customers and things like that. So this is very very flexible and since 1993 
internet has been using um, this method. Now we are going to see how uh, a host can be allocated a particular 32-bit address uh, from a network. Uh, this is very important because at the end of the day, IP addresses are used by these end devices. So, um, of course, there is this option of hard-coded allocation by the system admin. Uh, for example, if you are using Windows, then you can go all the way to control panel network configurations and the properties. Or if you're using Unix, uh, you can just use the simple command rc.config and uh, allocate a particular IP address uh, to this particular host manually. Uh, such manual allocations uh, have been there for a long time. Um, even these days, there are some manual allocations. Uh, but today, uh, we are going to talk about a particular protocol called DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Uh, which can uh, eliminate such manual uh, allocation and make it uh, much more flexible uh, for allocating addresses to hosts, especially that uh, we are using a lot of mobile devices and entering different networks all the time. So it becomes more like plug and play and doesn't require any, uh, any, any human intervention at all. So the goal is uh, of DHCP, of course, is to dynamically obtain uh, automatically uh, from the network uh, using the machine rather than human. Um, and the uh, other uh, use is that to reuse the addresses and, um, and release it uh, when you are not using this address. So the same address can be used uh, by different machines uh, uh, at different times. If, uh, if you allocate, uh, if you hard coded it uh, manually, then it stays with the device uh, until you manually uh, change that address. Uh, but if it's a plug and play, then you can have more dynamic allocations, means more efficient uses of the addresses in time. And of course, this is uh, very, very useful for mobile devices because uh, if you just walk in with your uh, mobile phone uh, in a Wi-Fi network, then it can automatically get an IP address uh, from that Wi-Fi ne wi network and configure itself on its own without requiring any manual intervention. So DHCP protocol is very, very useful uh, for wireless and mobile networking. So how does DHCP work? Um, it basically has four phases, discover, offer, request, and then you acknowledge. So here we have an example uh, of a um, laptop uh, entering into the right-hand side 223.1.2.0 slash 24 network. And it's going to use DHCP and uses those discover um, and request and all those four phases that we are going to see next. Here you can see that there is a DHCP, DHCP server uh, in this network. Um, usually every network will have a DHCP server uh, to support this kind of automatic address allocation to mobile hosts. Okay, so at the left hand side you have the DHCP server which is uh, 223.1.2.5 uh, listening at port 67 and at the right hand side you have the arriving client a laptop uh, which wants to um, find out uh, what address it can use uh, from this network so laptop uh, initially broadcasts a dhcp discover uh, message uh, with its source address as zero because it doesn't have an ip address yet and destination is a broadcast so it's all ones to five five 255 and everything and uh, it sends that uh, packet on the network there may be multiple DHCP servers uh, they will all receive it and for this particular DHCP server it responds uh, again as a broadcast message because it doesn't know the IP address of the uh, client so it uses 255 and it says that, uh, look, um, I can allocate you a, a, an address 223.1.2.4 if you want. 
and I can give you for 3600 seconds. Uh, that's about uh, one hour. Is that one hour? Sixty minutes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, DHCP. Um, so the uh, when the laptop receives it, um, it might receive uh, other offers like this from other DHCP servers uh, in the network. Um, but let's say that this if this laptop wants to accept it, then again it broadcasts this saying that yes, uh, I'm interested in accepting this offer. Um, the, the reason it broadcasts is because then the other uh, DHCP servers, which also offered uh, to this laptop, can see this and they, they can release that uh, temporary um, allocation because once it offers, then it has to temporarily allocate it so that it doesn't offer the same thing to other uh, laptops. Then finally, um, this DHCP server will send an acknowledgement uh, saying, um, look, okay, so you can use this IP address uh, for 3600 seconds. And after that, this laptop uh, will start using this IP address. So this is as simple as just four uh, steps. And all these things are happening in the local network. So it's very fast. Uh, it's in a second or two, it happens, and then uh, you are connected. DHCP uh, is not about just giving you the IP address. So the server actually gives you a few other things. It, it tells you what is the DNS server, uh, what is your network mask, and what is the first hub router to get out of uh, this uh, gateway. Uh, what is the gateway router to get out of this uh, network? You need all these three pieces of information if you want to actually start communicating as you know that without dns uh, server we don't know how to so resolve the ip address and the names and things like that so dhcp is very very useful it's kind of a, 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 a complete configuration of your device uh, ready to be uh, connected to, uh, to and, and communicated on the internet so next few slides just graphically shows you the same thing uh, through animation so the, the router comes in uh, and then um, it um, needs an IP address, so it sends the DHCP request, which is going to uh, the server, and then uh, all the way to the DHCP application level. And then um, the server formulates um, and then sends uh, a message to the laptop. And uh, then finally, uh, you know, uh, you, you have the IP address. If you are doing the labs, uh, then you should be able to do it in your home uh, network. For example, uh, in using Wireshark, you should be able to see um, all these fields uh, within the um, IP and the Ethernet uh, frame as well to get a deeper understanding of uh, DHCP. So I... Uh, uh, so, so what we have learned is that DHCP uh, is very, um, very, very uh, flexible for automatic configuration of your uh, device to get an IP address, and um, uh, it, it, it includes a lot of information uh, such as IP address, the length of the lease, subnet mask, uh, DS server, uh, DNS servers, gateway, and things like that. We just want to say that uh, the, the DHCP uh, can be subject to attacks, uh, but there are mechanisms to protect against that, and we are not going to go into uh, details uh, of those security uh, at the moment. Now we are going to look at a concept called network address translation. IPv4 has 32-bit addresses, so the um, address space is limited. And with the growing demand for addresses and all these mobile devices, it is very difficult uh, to provide unique IP address to all the devices uh, at any given time. It's, it's becoming more and more uh, challenging to find uh, available IP addresses. So um, solutions are needed uh, to find uh, ways to conserve the address space in the IPv4 uh, domain. 
So network address translation, as you will see later, will allow you to uh, use this same address many times. And this is linked to this concept called private addresses, which was designed uh, in, in, from the very beginning uh, when the Internet was uh, designed 40 years ago. So what is private address? So if you look at uh, slash 8, uh, then you will see there are 16 million addresses that are private. So anything that starts with 10 uh, is a private. And in the slash 12, anything that starts with 172.16 you ha uh, is is private and there's about 1 million uh, private addresses in slash 12 and in slash 16 you have 65,536 private addresses anything that starts with uh, 192.168 if you use any of these addresses um, uh, in your IP header and send this IP packet to the internet eh, any router in the internet would simply just drop it because they, these are private addresses. This is in RFC, uh, and this is clearly, um, you know, defined in these standards. So the manufacturers, um, the the Cisco routers, for example, uh, they are uh, designed to uh, drop packets which are in this range. However. Uh, that doesn't stop you to use these uh, addresses in your uh, private network um, because um, you are routing packets within your network. So as long as you are uh, as long as you are not sending packets outside to the internet with these addresses, you, you can still use it, and that creates an opportunity to conserve IPv4 addresses in a dramatic way which we are going to study next. Basically, you need two things. The outgoing datagrams that are going out to the pri uh, from private to the uh, public, uh, you need to replace the source IP address with the public one. And you will see that we also need to change the port. And I will explain later why we need to change the port. And the incoming datagram, uh, you will need to, again, change the IP address and the port number. So let's go through this example and animation. Okay, so at the right hand side, we have this public uh, private network 10. Uh, uh, slash 24, and you have this uh, NAT router, and it has two interfaces in the private side. The interface is 10.0.0.4, and at the um, outside, you have 138.76.29.7. And this is a public uh, IP address, and the rest of the world can recognize this net router and can route any packet to this net router using 138.76.29.7. Now, in step one, let's say uh, host 10.0.0.1 uh, wants to browse a web server in the internet 128.119.40.186. Uh, so it sends a packet with destination uh, port 80 um, and the source address is the private address. Now let's see what happens when it goes through the uh, NAT router. NAT router um, has to translate uh, the uh, source address because uh, if you keep the source address as 10.0.0.1, then it will be dropped right in the uh, internet as we discussed so it has to be translated to 138.76.29.7 so you can see the source has been translated and the destination is still the same but here the source uh, port number is also translated we replaced 3345 by 5001 and it is stored in the table so why the port is translated Okay, so the idea of this table is to use a, to use a unique port number in this table for all communications that are happening at any time. And this is difficult if you do not uh, translate the port number because the port numbers are randomly generated by the operating system. So in this case, 3345 is generated by host 1, 10.0.0.1. But if host 2 starts another communication, there is a possibility that it can also generate 3345 
in this case we won't have a unique identifier in this nav translation table and you will see soon why we need a unique um, port uh, identifier to identify a particular communication at any given time so let's see in step three when the uh, web server from the internet responds when it responds, uh, the destination address is 138.76.297 and the destination port is 5001 because it doesn't know anything about 10.0.0.1 or the port number 3345 because this was translated before the net forwarded it to the internet. Now this information, this 5001 can be used in the table to match this row and find out how to translate back that destination address. So now it finds out, oh, the destination has to be 10.0.0.1 and the destination port should be 3345 because it's in the table. So it replaces that and then forwards it uh, to the local network. And now we have no problem because the uh, local machine can detect that its address is 10.0.0.1. So we can see how by using a table in the uh, NAT router we can automate this translation process and can share a single IP address by many machines in the private network. So of course the advantages uh, is that you can use a single IP address um, to, um, to connect many devices in the internet and this is how you are conserving IPv4 addresses. And also because you are using private addresses you can change the addresses in your local network without worrying. You don't need, you don't need to update anyone else in the world. And you can also change your ISP without changing the addresses of your devices in the local network because these are just private networks. Uh, these are just private addresses. Is there any disadvantage? Of course, uh, the disadvantage is that you are violating the layering principle and um, the NAT router is now uh, playing with your port number, uh, which is a TCP thing, and uh, is, 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 is violating the layering principle. And there are other disadvantages that we are going to discuss uh, soon. Uh, but another thing is that a major fundamental problem here is that uh, there are many uh, devices in the world now will have the same IP addresses because you are using the private address space. So you don't uh, have actually unique IP addresses in the world uh, in a sense. Uh, and uh, this is just a conceptual problem. This is not a real problem. So the interesting question here is that um, the, the, the local network is not explicitly addressable or it's not actually visible by the routers from outside the world. And is this an advantage or is there uh, any disadvantage? So um, as you will see, uh, as you have seen already, there is an advantage because it's not visible so you can change your uh, addresses whenever you want. You can change ISPs without changing your addresses and things like that. And it can also be disadvantage if it's not visible then maybe connecting uh, to your uh, devices may be difficult because they can't see your address. And this is something we are going to discuss next. So interesting thing here is because we are using the port number to uniquely identify the connections that are going on in a NAT. And because it's a 16-bit port number, you can practically support 65,000, uh, uh, more than 65,000 simultaneous connections at the same time. It means that um, practically uh, 65,000 devices uh, can use uh, and share a single IP address. So what are the practical uh, issues uh, if you are using NAT? So uh, you are modifying the port number um, um, and this may create some problem if uh, the port numbers are used 
in the application, uh, in the communication that are happening in the application level. For example, FTP. So FTP uses these port numbers. Uh, DNS uses these port numbers. SIP. They use these port numbers. It means that uh, in the uh, payload of the TCP, that's where the application data is, there will be these port numbers. And unless you go deep in the packet, in the application layer, then uh, then, then you, you, you cannot make it work because the, you have changed the port number. So it's not enough to change the port number in the... Uh, uh, the TCP or UDP header, you have to go inside the payload of TCP to change the port numbers if there is anything. So this can create a problem if you, you are using encryption. For example, if your TCP payload is encrypted, then we have a problem. And there's another uh, problem, maybe uh, TCP sequence number. Uh, in some cases, the, the, it may be necessary uh, to change your TCP sequence number because the, your original TCP se sequence number may not be uh, valid anymore after the NAT translation. So I want you to think about it and, and see if you can find out when it is necessary. And we can discuss that asynchronously in the forum. We still have net traversal problems. Uh, so because it's not visible, the machines, the addresses inside the private network is not visible from the outside. The question is, uh, how do we traverse the net? Like if you are running a server inside your private network, then how the other people can connect to your server? And if you want to connect to outside servers, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking, such as a Skype, for example, how they can communicate with you because you do not have uh, the public uh, IP address. So we are going to see how we can overcome these uh, traversal uh, issues. So here is the first example of net traversal problem. So uh, let's say a client inside the private network 10.0.0.1 wants to um, communicate um, so, so, sorry, let's say that you want to um, host a server uh, in 10.0.0.1 uh, because 10.0.0.1 is a private number, you cannot advertise this IP address uh, as a server uh, in the world. Um, so you have to advertise only the public IP address of the net, which is 138.76.29.7. And um, the rest of the world will have to try to connect to the server using this public address. But you have many hosts here. So how do you solve the problem? So one thing you can do, you can um, statically, manually configure your net router with the server port number. So let's say that this uh, service you are running is on port uh, 2500. Uh, in this case, uh, you can advertise saying that, yeah, yeah, hey, I am running a um, server on 138.76.29.7 uh, at port 2500. So if anyone sends that packet, it will come to your net router. And you can statically configure the net router to send that packet to 10.0.0.1 because that's where you are running the server. So it can translate it to 10.0.0.1 and, and, and forward the packet uh, to that server. So in this case, this is going to work. So uh, the question is, can we automate this? And now we have um, uh, standards and protocols such as IGD, which can be used uh, to uh, automate this kind of thing. So you can just run a, uh, a server in any machine in your private network, and the net router will be automatically configured uh, so that the packets are uh, routed to that service. Now we are going to look at how peer-to-peer -peer, uh, can work, uh, how the net traversal can be solved, for example, for Skype. So we are going to use this animation to explain this. So in step one, a client inside the net 10.0.0.1 
it establishes a connection with a relay, a Skype relay outside the um, uh, private network. Then in step two, uh, the peer uh, in the public domain uh, also establishes connection with the relay. Then in step three, the relay uh, just creates a bridge between these two connections. So now these two clients, one is outside and one is inside the private network, can communicate via this relay. So obviously we can overcome the net traversal problem for peer-to-peer -peer networks, but uh, you need this kind of relay uh, services outside the private network. NAT is really uh, gaining a lot of uh, attention and um, despite all these uh, theoretical problems, um, it is gaining a lot of popularity um, and um, it, it can support all these translations uh, easily at 100 megabits per second these days. Uh, and with the hardware um, speed going up, uh, this shouldn't be a problem with even higher speed uh, local area networks. And uh, because IPv6 is still not widely deployed, uh, I think address space uh, needs to be conserved, and that's why NET is uh, still uh, is, is very popular at the moment. In the very beginning, uh, IETF was not very... Um, willing to support NAT because this is, uh, violates the layering principle. Uh, but now ITF is releasing uh, protocols for NAT, such as we have seen uh, some practical uh, standards such as IGD, which can be used to um, automate the services within the private network. So here is an interesting exercise you can take in Google. You can type, what's my IP? And the Google will tell you, this is your IP. So here um, I have uh, my uh, IP address uh, from my configuration in the home network and I, I can see it says my IP address is 10.248.15.210. Obviously it starts, uh, it's a private uh, IP address because it starts with 10, right? And when I ask Google what is my IP address, Google says your IP address is 129.94.8.210 because I'm running it from Uniwide, and you know that UNSW has this 129.94. So before, so it means that in this particular case, uh, a NAT was definitely used, and the IP address that was allocated to me was actually a private IP address. So this is an interesting exercise you can try with your home network if you want. Okay, so let's uh, try to solve uh, a couple of um, exercises or quizzes, if you like. So the first one, we have a private uh, address, 192.168.0.2. And um, it has a port number 4567. It wants to connect to a server uh, in the public domain, 34.5.6.7. And the NAT's public address is 22.33.45.55. Now the question is, when the mapping takes place in the NAT router, uh, which mapping is the correct mapping? Okay, so the correct answer should be D, um, because... Um, uh, the question is, uh, which of the following mapping could be the NAT uh, create as a result? Okay, so you can see 20, so is, uh, the correct answer is D because you can see 22.33.44.55 uh, has to be mapped to 192.168.0.2 and 3967. Uh, which is uh, the um, one created by the NAT uh, is mapped back to 4567. Um, okay. 
So here uh, we didn't have the 3967 in the question, but this is something that uh, you, you have to understand that uh, NAT creates a, um, a unique port number and it, it, it translates um, the, the port number as well. Okay, so the next question, uh, it says that, okay, so you have a private host 192.168.0.2 and it uh, is connected to a server 34.5.6.7 uh, with its local port 4567 and the public is again 22.33.44.55. And let's say that it created uh, the mapping, uh, which is 22, 33, 45, 55, 3, 9, 6, 7, to 192, to 168.0.2 to 4567 in, in its table, like we have seen in the previous uh, quiz. Now the question is, what are the source and destination port numbers in the scene ACK response from the server? So this particular question takes you all the way back to TCP. And if you remember, TCP is a three-way handshake. So it creates the, uh, the, the scene and the server has to uh, send back a scene ACK. So scene packet was sent by this private client to the server. And now server is sending back the scene ACK. So the question is, what would be the source and destination port numbers uh, in this CNAC? Because the CNAC is coming from the server, the correct answer would be A, because uh, the source port would be 80, because it's a web server. And the destination port number would be 3967, because um, the NAT translation uh, converted 4567 to 3967 before it sent the packet to the server. So the server only knows about 3967. It doesn't know about 4567. Okay, so what we have learned today is network address translation, uh, which uh, allows uh, many machines, private machines, private IP numbers to share a, a single um, public uh, IP address using a simple table in an automated fashion. So this is very, very popular. And this is very much in use in the network as we have shown you through a practical example of uh, what's my IP address test. Um, so this actually concludes our uh, network address translation uh, topic. Uh, so in this picture what you see is uh, at the right hand side you have this private network and uh, you can see it starts with uh, 10. So um, uh, you, you have uh, 10.1, 10.2, 10.3, you have three uh, hosts in your network. They are all uh, slash 24 private network uh, addresses. And uh, the way you are going to connect your private network to the internet is by using a network address translation, um, which uh, will use one public IP address, 138 in this case, dot 76.29.7, uh, which will be your public IP address uh, for your site. It means that uh, whenever you want to communicate uh, to the rest of the world, uh, you will be known by 138.76.29.7. So the question is, um, I have so many uh, devices. In this case, you have three different uh, devices, 10.1, 10.2, 10.3. So how they are going to use three devices going to use a single IP address? How do you share that? So that is the uh, problem that is solved by network address translation. So now we are going to see how it works. Because IPv6 is coming, um, we are going to have a short discussion about uh, how uh, IPv6 can be supported um, in the IPv4 infrastructure. So as you might have guessed, uh, the initial motivation of IPv6 um, was uh, that the address space was running out in IPv4 with 32-bit addresses and the NAT and all these things we had to do just to conserve the IPv4 address. <coughs> So IPv6 um, uh, proposes 120-bit um, address space and, um, you know, they say that uh, every grain of sand in the world can be uh, addressed with 128 bits because it's 2 to the power 128. 
and uh, IPv6 has 40 byte uh, header instead of um, 20 byte IPv4 uh, header uh, because uh, the header has very long um, uh, 128 bit source and destination addresses. We are not going to go into details of I, how IPv6 actually works, but this this one just shows that we have a 128-bit source address and 128-bit um, destination address. And IPv6 um, also will work with ICMP version 6, so it's compatible uh, with IPv6. What we are interested in uh, in this course is to show the tunneling. Um, so how IPv6 can be carried uh, over the existing IPv4 structure uh, for the time being uh, when we do not have um, every single router in the internet converted to IPv6. So tunneling is a concept uh, to carry IPv6 over IPv4. So in this picture at the bottom, you can see this is the IPv4 datagram. Uh, the blue uh, area is the uh, payload area, IPv4 payload, and uh, the red uh, is the uh, header. And now if you want to do tunneling, then you put the IPv6 datagram inside the IPv4 payload. So let's look at uh, an example. So here you can see at the left hand side we have routers A and B which are IPv6 and at the right hand side uh, we have um, uh, routers E and F which are also IPv6. So those uh, two at the left and right are uh, IPv6 networks but uh, they need to communicate over the internet and in the internet not everything is IPv6 so we have a series of um, IPv4 uh, routers in this case C and D so this is the physical view and the data has to go from A to F uh, so how can we do that so the logical view is that uh, you can create an IPv4 tunnel between B and E so uh, IPv6 routers think that there is a tunnel and it can go through the IPv4 tunnel so the question is how we can achieve this tunneling. So here is uh, an animation. So you can see um, uh, A wants to send uh, a packet to F. Uh, so uh, it is an IPv6 packet. Um, and uh, from A to B is just IPv6 packet because uh, both A and B uh, speak IPv6. But when B wants to, says when B sends it to C, uh, then it has to put it in IPv4 packet. Um, and as you can see, it goes into the uh, payload of the IPv4. And in the header, um, it is a IPv4 header. And the destination uh, is um, uh, E and the source is B. Then C to D, no problem. When D wants to send to E, it has to um, uh, send uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the packet. Um, um, it, it has to uh, take, the, take the packet off. So that's what it's doing. So it, it takes the IPv6 packet out and then IPv6 packet is uh, transmitted in the IPv6 network and there is no problem. So uh, the tunneling is uh, an effective method uh, to um, carry IPv6 over IPv4. What we see here is that tunneling is uh, actually a very general uh, concept in uh, IPv4 networks. It's not just only used for carrying IPv6, but it can be used for many different purposes. Uh, you uh, must be familiar with the virtual private networks and VPN also uses tunneling. However, VPN uses, uh, VPN uses uh, IPv4 in IPv4 tunneling. So in this example, you can see everything is IPv4. It still, still is using tunneling because of security. So at the left-hand side, you have uh, a private network and the right-hand side another private network and they want to communicate over the public network. They don't trust the public network, so they are going to use tunneling. Uh, 
So in this case, if you look at the outer header, you can see uh, A to B is normal IPv4, no tunneling because it's within the private network. But when it uh, travels into the public network, it is put into uh, in the payload of an IP packet. And at the other end, uh, the, the, it is de-encapsulated and it is brought back from the tunnel. Okay, so that uh, sort of uh, ends uh, the data plane uh, section uh, chapter, if you like. Um, so we have uh, learned how an IP data packet uh, is processed within a router and forwarded uh, within an IP router. What are the fields in the IP header and um, what are their functions? So next, uh, we are going to move on to a control plane, uh, which uh, will be responsible for creating the forwarding tables uh, for the data plane. So with that, uh, we conclude uh, this week's lecture.